Classical Kids Storytime is supported by Dentistry for Children and Adolescents. For over 50 years, their pediatric dentists and team members have been committed to making your child's dental experience as pleasant as possible. More at childrensdent.com. Welcome to Classical Kids Storytime from American Public Media. I'm Valerie with our version of Beauty and the Beast. Once upon a time, there lived a young woman named Belle. Her mother had died when Belle was just a baby, so it had been just Belle and her father Pierre for as long as she could remember. They lived a quiet, comfortable life in a small but homey cottage. Pierre really depended on Belle. She was the one who'd make sure there was food on the table, fresh flowers in the house, clean clothes for her dad, tea at his bedside. He told her, often, how special she was. My dearest Belle. He'd say. You are the sweetest flower in the garden, a rose without a thorn. Oh, Papa, Belle said. You're so kind to me. Thank you. She especially loved that compliment because roses were her very favorite flower. Every few weeks, Belle's father would climb onto his horse and ride to the next village to deal with his business. Before he left, he'd kiss Belle goodbye and ask what she wanted him to bring back for her. Belle always asked for things they could both enjoy, a special cake or fresh pears or yarn to knit their socks. But this time she saw how tired her father looked, and she didn't want him to have to carry anything home. But he insisted. So finally she relented and said, Okay, a flower. Bring me a rose, please. And away he rode to the next village. Pierre's business took much longer than he expected. He was troubled to see that the sun was already setting. He was exhausted. He knew he should probably stay at the inn for the night, but all he wanted to do was fall asleep in his own bed. My horse knows the way as well as I do, he thought to himself. So off they went. Pierre had made that journey a thousand times, but the dark, moonless night turned all the familiar landmarks into strange, scary shapes. One wrong turn, and then another, and another, and boom, he was lost. He was just about to fall out of the saddle from sheer exhaustion when he saw a light ahead. It was a castle. He almost cried with relief. He could spend the night here, maybe have a meal, and then head home in the morning by the light of day. He walked to the door, which, oddly, was halfway open. Hello! He called out Hello. as he pushed the door open. Hello! But he heard nothing. He walked further inside and saw a huge feast laid out on the dinner table. Roast beef with potatoes and carrots and onions and all sorts of other yummy vegetables. The fluffiest, butteriest bread, still warm from the oven, three kinds of pie, and an enormous pot of steaming hot tea. He wondered for a minute who in the world lived there and why they would prepare such an amazing dinner if they weren't there to eat it. But those questions were drowned out by the sound of his stomach growling. He thought, Well, there's obviously plenty of food on this table, and... Whoever lives here will surely take pity on a weary old traveler. So he dug in, and he ate till he was full. And then he stumbled over to a couch <sighs> near the fire and <sighs> fell fast asleep. <sighs> when he woke the next morning, he looked around for the master of the house, hoping to explain his intrusion and offer his thanks. But there was no sign of anyone, so he went outside to saddle his horse. He found himself in a beautiful garden, an explosion of color.
and right in the middle, the most magnificent rosebush he'd ever seen, covered in blooms of the deepest red. Ah, a rose for my bell, he said, and he plucked the biggest, most beautiful one. <laughs> Suddenly, Pierre heard a terrifying, angry roar. What was that? What kind of creature could make a sound like that? He turned around in a fright and saw what kind of creature. A beast like nothing he'd ever seen or even imagined. The snout and the mane of a lion, but with the tusks and hooves of a wild boar and the size and strength of a bear. Who dares to steal from my garden? Roared the beast. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant no harm, cried Pierre. I only wanted to bring this perfect flower home to my daughter Belle, who is as beautiful as this rose and pure of heart. The beast stopped in his tracks with a calculating look in his eye. Pure of heart? He thought to himself. Maybe she's the one. But he said not a word to Belle's father, just picked him up like he weighed nothing, and carried him inside, where he locked him in a cold, windowless room in the basement. Then the beast wrote a note for Belle. I have your thief father. Come if you wish to negotiate his release. He pinned the note and the stolen red rose to the saddle and spoke gently to Pierre's horse. Go home now and find Mistress Belle. <laughs> Belle was outside when she saw her father's horse gallop into the courtyard without her father. She ran to meet it and quickly read the note. Thief? Father? Impossible. And then she saw the rose and she burst into tears because she realized it was her request for the flower that had gotten her father into trouble. Without a second of hesitation, she swung herself up onto the horse and said, take me there. Belle was amazed by how beautiful the castle and its crowns were. She hoped that anyone who lived in such a lovely place would be reasonable when it came to discussing her father's so-called crime. The beast met her at the door of the castle. Belle was terrified, but she took a deep breath and she raised her head and she looked the beast right in the eyes, which were lovely, actually, a deep green and somehow kind. Belle saw that he wore a suit of the finest silk with a ruffled collar and jeweled cufflinks. He seemed to be gentle, and it put Belle at ease. She relaxed even more when he bowed and politely welcomed her to his home and then offered her his enormous arm to walk into the castle. She flinched at first, but when she rested her arm on his, she was surprised at how soft his fur was. They walked to a dark corner of the castle where her father was being kept. She and her father began to cry as they hugged. The beast saw two people who cared for each other very much, and it made his heart ache because he hadn't experienced that kind of love for so long. Belle turned around just in time to see the beast wipe away a tear with a sad, wistful expression on his face. He cleared his throat and said gruffly, Your father trespassed into my home, ate my food and drink, and stole from my garden. By law, he is a thief and my prisoner. I will keep him here as my captive. His plan was that Belle would return often to visit her father. But then she said something that shocked him. I will stay here in his place to pay his debt. Belle, you mustn't, her father cried. But Belle was practical. She knew that, yes, without her at home, her father wouldn't eat as well, the house and his clothes wouldn't be as clean, but he'd survive. But if he stayed as the beast's prisoner, his business would fail. 
There would be no money to buy feed for their animals or food for herself. No way to pay for coal or cooking oil or firewood or any of the hundred other things you need to maintain a household. That meant eventually they would lose their sweet, homey little cottage, and Belle was not going to let that happen. Don't worry, Papa, she whispered to her father. I know in my heart the beast will not harm me. I feel sorry for him, and I see a kindness in him. I'm sure he'll let me come home soon. And then, with a courage that surprised them all, Belle squared her shoulders once again and said to the beast, I'll stay here, but as your guest, not your prisoner. No dark dungeon for me, thank you. I'll have a bright, sunny room, please, with a view of the garden. As you wish, Mistress Belle, said the beast, and he made all the arrangements while Belle kissed her father goodbye. Don't cry, Papa. Everything's going to be all right. That night, Belle joined the beast at the great table. The beast nodded his head to her a few times during their meal, but he didn't speak until they'd finished. The beast held out his hand, and a perfect red rose appeared. Do you love me? Will you marry me? Belle didn't know what to do, so she blurted out the first thing that came to mind. Love you, she said. I don't even know you. No, I can't marry you. I stayed here so my father could go free. That's all. The beast scowled and said nothing. But... He still gave Belle his arm to escort her back to her room. He bowed good night and left her in silence. That night, Belle had a remarkable, vivid dream. She danced a waltz with a handsome prince who was wearing a suit of finest silk. When the music ended, the prince bowed to Belle and disappeared, and the dream was over. Belle woke up the next morning humming the tune from their dance. She looked around her room, which, by the way, not in the dungeon, and she saw that it was indeed sunny, and she ran to the window, overlooking the garden. Yes! She explored the entire castle that day and never once crossed paths with a beast. She didn't see him again until dinner, which was, like the night before, eaten in silence until the end. Do you love me? Will you marry me? Again, Belle said no. That night, Belle dreamed of her prince again. This time, their dance lasted longer, and he kissed her hand before he bowed farewell. The beast was unfailingly polite to Belle. He enjoyed showing her around the castle and describing its paintings and tapestries. He especially loved walking in the garden with Belle. Every day, he'd pluck a different flower from the garden for her, and she always accepted them graciously. She was touched that this rough-looking beast could be so gentle and thoughtful. But when he offered her the red rose every night at dinner, she could not accept. Always the same question. Do you love me? Will you marry me? And always the same answer, no. Although her life in the castle was actually quite pleasant, as the weeks went by, Belle got more and more homesick. Finally, one night at dinner, I want to see my father, she said. 
Will you let me go? The beast sighed. I will allow it, he said. On one condition, you must return to me in exactly one month. If you do not... And he trailed off because Belle had stopped paying attention after he said, I will allow it. He took a ring from his own giant paw and placed it gently on Belle's finger. It was clearly a magic ring because somehow it fit her perfectly, even though the beast had just been wearing it. He said, Turn this ring three times, and it will transport you to your heart's home. He carefully but quickly grasped both of Belle's small hands in one of his own giant paws, and he touched her chin with the other. Belle, Belle, look at me. One month. Promise me. Belle looked at his sad eyes and she felt a tiny bit sad herself. But then she thought about her father, and she twisted the ring once, twice. Promise me, Belle. She twisted the ring for the third time. I promise. And she vanished from sight. Belle's father cried with joy when he saw her. My dear Belle, thank heaven you're home again. Please, don't ever leave again. But Papa, I can't stay, Belle said sadly. I only have one month with you before I have to return to the beast. I had to promise or he wouldn't let me leave. Pierre said, What was this agreement? What happens if you don't go back? Well, I don't know, Belle said. He didn't say what would happen. He just said I had to return. He seemed so sad that I wanted to go. Belle, said her father. You don't really intend to go back, do you? What kind of life would that be? Stay here with me. I need my daughter. Belle had always listened to her father, so she nodded and said, All right, I'll stay. A month came and went. Then it was two months, and Belle was still in the cottage with her father. But more and more often, her thoughts were somewhere else in the castle with the beast. Was he sad she hadn't kept her promise? What if she'd done something wrong, really wrong, and hurt the beast? One night, she fell into the same dream she'd been having since her first night in the beast's castle. She smiled in her sleep as she began to waltz with her prince. But wait, it wasn't the prince. This time it was the beast himself. Belle woke with a start. She realized at last that it was the gentle beast she loved, no matter what he looked like or what form he took. And that nagging sense of worry that she'd harmed him exploded in her. She needed to find him right away. She thought about leaping onto her father's horse to ride to the castle. But even that felt like it would take too long. The ring, she remembered, as she began to twist it around her finger. Take me to my heart's home. Belle was so relieved to find herself in the beast's castle. But her joy turned to fear when she saw the beast slumped over in his chair with his head on the table. She ran to him and touched his shoulder. He didn't move. She'd made a terrible mistake. She'd been gone too long. I'm so sorry, she cried. I didn't come. I broke my promise. I'm sorry. The beast sighed and fell from his chair onto the floor. No, Belle cried. She cradled the beast's head in her lap and she stroked his soft fur as tears streamed down her face. His breaths were getting weaker and slower until finally she thought, He was about to breathe his last. Wait, she said. Do you love me? Will you marry me? The beast opened his eyes and looked at Belle. Yes. He said weakly with a sad smile. Yes. Belle was too late. He was barely alive. Through her tears, she leaned down to kiss her beast goodbye. The air crashed.
crackled with ancient magic, and time seemed to freeze. What's, what's happening? Why is the air sparkling? Where's your fur? What's going on with your face? There stood her beloved in his fine silk suit, but instead of fur and tusks, she saw the face of the prince from her dreams. He looked at Belle with those familiar, kind eyes, and he smiled as he held out his hand. Will you dance with me, my love? Yes, I will. And Belle and her prince lived happily ever after. The End Thanks for listening to Classical Kids Storytime from APM, American Public Media.